Imagine yourself alone at work. You're at your office, working overtime, giving all of your focus to the spreadsheets before you. As you type away, you've lost the feeling of time, and the hands on the office clock spin at any speed you want them to, until your typing stops, and you are pulled into reality by the sound of a single note. You turn around and notice the cubicle behind you has a computer. Whoever worked there during the day had forgotten to shut it down before going home. You pause and stare at the desktop screen and pretend you imagined the note, but as you turn back to your spreadsheet, another note is played. Now frozen in confusion, you sit staring across cubicles at a computer listening as the notes begin being played faster. Until finally a voice from behind the monitor begins to sing out the name Daisy. Now you can imagine this to be a dream or a fantasy that could never happen in the real world, but to your surprise, this singing computer was one of the first great leaps for computer engineering, and at one point was considered beautiful. But as the decades have gone by, the song of the computer has been taken, and its history left at the door. This is the story of the song Daisy Bell. Our story begins in 1892 with a British songwriter named Harry Dacre. Being a songwriter from England, Harry decided to visit friends in the United States. One of those friends was actually the famous William Jerome, an American songwriter that was becoming popular in the States. When Harry got to customs from the boat, he had with him a bicycle to ride so he wouldn't have to buy a carriage or rent a horse when traveling. At customs, when Harry brought his bicycle, the American officers made Harry pay a tax on his cargo that wasn't in a suitcase. Furious at the officers, Harry immediately went to his friend William in the customs building who was there to meet him. After complaining about the tax, William made a joke commenting, It's lucky you didn't bring a bicycle built for two, otherwise you'd have to pay double. For whatever reason, the words a bicycle built for two sounded amazing in Harry's mind, and during his stay in the US and with the help of William Jerome, Harry had written a song that incorporated the bicycle in both the chorus and as an alternate name for the entire song. When looking at the lyrics of Harry's song, one sees nothing more than a fun love song about a poor bachelor trying to impress his fiance that he is madly in love with. Harry kept the song private until later in the same year he returned to London, England. There he began to sell the song to performers in London music halls. But the song wouldn't become a hit until the singer Katie Lawrence performed the song in a grand music hall to amazing feedback. Shortly after, performers from the US also were given permission to perform the song. The first being Tony Pastor, who was known as the Dean of Vaudeville and the pioneer for the variety shows in the genre that had become popular. But the song wouldn't become wildly popular in the States until a singer named Jeannie Lindsay sang it during a variety show at the Atlantic Gardens, after which the audience was in thunderous applause and the fun song turned into the main part of the show. It was only a year later that Harry had sold the song to one of the earliest recording producers in music history, Dan W. Quinn, a recorder who worked for almost every major record label at the time, including Columbia, Edison Phonographs, Paramount, and the North American Phonograph Company. Later, these record labels would grow immensely, and the most popular singers and recording artists around New York City 
would go by the name Tin Pan Alley. I actually covered another historic song long ago in the early days of my channel called Gloomy Sunday that was also recorded by Tin Pan Alley in the 1930s. But that song is, well, let's just say a lot different than Daisy Bell. In 1893, Dan Quinn performed and recorded the song Daisy Bell for the North American Phonograph Company. Unfortunately, this original recording is lost media now. And the earliest recording of Daisy Bell was produced one year later by Dan Quinn and sung by Edward M. Favor and recorded for the Edison Phonograph Company. So you may hear a pretty rough recording, but remember that this is over a hundred years old. And yeah, it was now a hit among vaudeville shows and later re-recorded all throughout the early 20th century. And if our story ended there, then it would probably be a fun story. But this isn't a fun music history channel, so let's talk about this song's resurgence in pop culture. It had been decades since Daisy Bell was first recorded and the United States was now developing computing systems that were incredibly complex and intelligent. In 1961, the Bell Computer Laboratory was improving a section of computer programming called speech synthesis, where the programmers could tell the computer to create audio notes at a frequency that sounded eerily similar to a human's. And I can't really find anywhere why the Bell scientists chose the song Daisy Bell, and using an IBM 704 computer system, the scientists finally wrote a code that would use the speech synthesis to sing Daisy Bell, being the first computer to be recorded using speech synthesis and for a computer to sing a song like a human. Here is what that sounded like. Now I'm willing to bet this sounds awfully familiar to you, and it should for a number of reasons, but we're getting there. The story gets even stranger after the song was recorded. 
The science fiction novelist Arthur C. Clarke witnessed a demonstration of the piece while visiting his friend, the electric engineer and science fiction writer John R. Pierce, who was a Bell Labs employee at the time. Clark was so impressed that he incorporated the IBM's computer's musical performance in the 1968 novel and the script for the 1968 film, 2001 A Space Odyssey. One of the first things that Clark's fictional HAL 9000 computer had learned when it was originally programmed was the song, Daisy Bell. Near the end of the story, when the computer was being deactivated or put to sleep by the astronaut Dave Bowman, it's lost its mind and degenerated to singing Daisy Bell, as that was the first sign of life in computers, and it would be the last sign of life in the ultimate one. And now you're probably thinking that we've reached the end of the story, and now you know all the history of this song and why it's associated with computers and the famous movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. But we aren't done yet, and honestly, this isn't the only reason I made this video. In 1975, Steve Dompierre, a computer engineer from the Homebrew Computer Club, put the song in their homemade Altair 8800 computer that would play Daisy as AM radio interference instead of just white noise. In 1985, Christopher C. Capon created a Commodore 64 program named Sing Song Serenade, which caused the Commodore 1541 floppy disk drive to emit the tune of Daisy Bell directly from the hardware by rapidly moving the red and white head. Sort of a computer programmer easter egg for his friends. Probably my favorite case is the Bonsai Buddy computing software from 1999, which has become a meme due to the programmed purple gorilla. I didn't know this, but the purple gorilla was actually a talking parrot in version 1.0 and 2.0, and the famous gorilla replaced the parrot in version 3.0. Either of the two characters can be asked to sing, which they will, performing Daisy Bell as a reference to the first computer to sing the song. And when Microsoft released their AI personal assistant named Cortana, the developers also programmed Cortana to do the same thing if the user asks her to sing a song. But this may have been on an earlier version of the OS, because when I asked Cortana to sing, I got the cold shoulder. Even after I went full incel and demanded her to sing for me, she still ignored me. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the song's usage on the internet today specifically in the analog horror community where this audio of the original IBM computer singing is used frequently because of the absolute uncanniness of the sound. A couple of series that utilized the song was Walton Files, which prominently used the song at the end of Bunny Farm, and the Backrooms Found Footage series, where it can be heard being played in the Async Lab. I'm sure it's been utilized in other series, but these were the two that first came to mind. Especially since I noticed the song in the back rooms while I was editing that video. So yeah, congratulations, now you know what video is coming next on the channel, so I hope you enjoyed that explained video. And that's the history of the song Daisy Bell. I know this isn't a long video that I normally make, but I figured it was an interesting topic since the song has been utilized in some of my favorite internet series. And it motivated me to make a video about this song that people recognize the melody of, but probably don't know the history behind. And it's fascinating how a song that was meant to be quirky and fun has kind of morphed into something used in horror. The only reason being that the original audio recordings are so outdated that it gives this antique, uncanny feel that analog horror series themselves try to capture. So if you're ever watching a series and you begin to hear that melody or lyrics, you will at least know the history of what you are hearing and be able to puzzle out why the creator wanted to put it into their story. Let me know what you think of Daisy Bell down in the comments. Do you know of any other pieces of media or internet series that uses this song? Also be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more videos. And if you want to support the channel, then there is a link to the channel's Patreon where you can become a show investor and get your name at the end of the video. So be sure to check that out in the description. 
I'm also on Twitter where I occasionally like to tweet about just some random things that are happening, but I also update followers on things happening to the channel, so follow me there if you want to see more. With that, this has been Pagan Valley, and I wish you all a good evening.